The following presentation was recorded at the 2014 Southeast Linux Fest in Charlotte, North Carolina. It is licensed under a Creative Commons license. For more information, visit www.southeastlinuxfest.org. The Southeast Linux Fest would like to thank the following diamond sponsors in 2014 for helping make these videos possible. Good morning, folks. Uh, my name is Dave Stokes. I'm actually an Oracle employee who's going to be talking against big data. Um, for those of you who buy lottery tickets, it might be your lucky day. Um, as part of the rules for this talk, uh, if you have a question, please raise your hand and the gentleman in the back will come by with a microphone. Uh, if not, I'll try to repeat your question. So, what is big data? Uh, for those of you without gray hair, uh, the computer industry moves in cycles. Uh, those of you with gray hair, I can see are grimacing already. Uh, you'll hear something that's a new buzzword, and someone will come out and point out, well, gee, virtual instances of machines running on hardware. IBM. IBM had that 60s. in the 70s with I, the OS 360. Gee, putting your data out on another service, wasn't that CompuServe? <laughs> uh, so several years ago, uh, big data popped up. And of course, you've all probably been told that if you don't have a big data project, you're, you're an underachieving, slimy piece of trash, and you really should be ashamed of yourself, and you should go out and get big data. Um, I've been hitting a lot of the big data conferences, and each one of them I walk out of them going, what are they really trying to accomplish? So uh, when Jeremy was talking about submissions for this, I figured, well, I probably should have a talk that's not about my usual subject, which is MySQL. I should probably talk about big data. And I asked, um, well, what is big data? So I did what every good person in the US does when they have a question. I went up to Google, and I typed in big data. And I got 838 million hits. By the way, Google now just gives you an estimate. It doesn't give you the exact hits anymore. In the old days, they used to do that. So I figured, well, What's that relative to? How big is big? So I typed in world peace. <laughs> well, there's more people working on, world, on uh, big data than world peace, so that's kind of understandable. Big data will bring world peace. Hopefully. So I figured, well, how about the cure for cancer? Not even close. So I popped open a beer and I sat down, well, what are the other big things that are plaguing our society that everyone knows about and everyone's doing something about. Um, evidently, big data is bigger than everything else. Uh, absolutely stunning that even the Kardashians don't have a candle to big data. So, my next question, being someone who is educated at a liberal arts Catholic college, is big data good? Well, on May 19th of this year, in the Wall Street Journal, I found an article on banking and big data. And in the third paragraph, I saw something that made me pop open my mouth and go, what are they thinking about? And as you can see, the key element in success for any project involving big data is accepting and embracing decision making with less than ideal information. Um, how many of you would feel comfortable telling your boss, here's my recommendation and it's made with less than ideal information? So, figuring with banks and less than ideal information, what could go wrong there? So, I dug into the literature on big data. Uh, I was lucky that I was at an O'Reilly conference and I was able to snag their big book on big data. And I was looking for success stories. Well, they had one. By the way, all these slides are on slideshare.net slash Dave Stokes, so don't worry about trying to memorize this or copy it down or take photographs of it. You can read it all later. And I have annotated the things that I put out there. So this was a story about Walmart. Walmart is a very successful company. Good or bad, you have to admire that they've basically gone from a little five and dime store in the middle of nowhere, Arkansas, to a worldwide conglomerate. They were looking at their data, and they figured out 
that before a big hurricane hit Florida, that they need to stock up on two things, beer and strawberry Pop-Tarts. Um, I, 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 could, I figured out the beer and the strawberry Pop-Tarts, you figure, well, strawberry Pop-Tarts pop -tarts are good forever. They come in that foil. You can throw them in the back of the closet if the hurricane doesn't wipe you out. You still got food. And then I started really thinking about it. And occasionally you see an article like this where the authors are surprised at the, um, the basically the rednecks in Florida and their demands before a, a hurricane. And I got thinking that their problem wasn't that, it's that Walmart didn't realize that their rednecks were different than the Florida rednecks. <laughs> now in Arkansas you have tornadoes, which are like hurricanes, but they're much shorter duration and usually not as extensive. And if you check in Arkansas, before big floods, they still have the amazing propensity that they want beer and Pop-Tarts. So here's a, a cute little cartoon. Yes, sir? I have a comment to go along with that. There's a better Walmart story. Okay. Do a Google search for the parable of beer and diapers. Walmart back in the early 90s had a Kroger card type of thing where they scanned the the customer scanned the card and then they were able to process. According to the story, they found a correlation between young men, like in their 20s, and two common items that they had in their shopping cart on Friday afternoons. Beer and diapers. These weren't adult diapers, they are actually diapers for children, right? <laughs> These were I, I, I know diapers. some guys that yeah. would save time. So if you go into a Walmart super center now, look to see where the diapers and the beer are, and if you'll notice, they're in the back of the store close together. Cool. But that's a story, that's a better story than the one you had. Yeah, I'll have to incorporate that. Uh, Target actually has a program where if you sign up uh, with their thing announcing that you're having a baby, and you're gonna have a baby shower that eight to ten, 10 months later they start sending you coupons for diapers and then they start sending you coupons for formula and then the 2T, 3T stuff. Uh, it hasn't been around long enough so that when the kid hits 16 they automatically start shipping you Maalox. Um, but um, a lot of the studies that you read about open, well big data, if you read them carefully with a jaundiced eye you, you tend to spot other problems with them. So my next step, after figuring out the success stories were kind of amazing to me, is I went out to Wikipedia, like all good data scientists do, and started figuring out, well, what does Wikipedia consider big data? Well, basically the answer is big data is much bigger than you have now. So go out and buy disk drives. So if you're gonna go out and play with big data, what do you need? Well, if you go out to uh, Cloudera and start talking about running a Hadoop cluster, uh, the first thing you notice is they have two types of nodes. Uh, one is for holding data, and the other is for organizing, coalescing, processing, and all that. And then when you start looking at the recommendations for that, you realize that these are the most expensive boxes that you can find. So if you go through, and you look for the things with the bonded ethernets and the high quad core processors are better and all the memory you can get. You start adding things up. And you figure, well, I'm gonna need at least a couple of these. What is the average person doing with their Hadoop cluster? Well, according to this study, the average Hadoop cluster starts off with around 200 boxes. Um, has anyone ever here signed a purchase order for over $2 million before? Um, when the stuff finally showed up, was it mountainous? It was just, did, did you get a lot of stuff for $2 million? A lot of packing materials. <laughs> uh, part of the Y2K thing, I bought over $10 million of computers for a government contractor. Um, I didn't know they'd all show up on the same day. <laughs> uh, I didn't know that the trucker would drop them off in front of the building at 6.30 in the morning. And I also didn't realize it would take up all the parking lot. There was no place to park. A uh, great way to win, uh, win friends and influence enemies. Yeah, I got a lot of stuff uh, right before a rainstorm and had to literally put computers in toilet stalls just to keep them off the, off the parking lot. So if you go out and buy your 
200 boxes, you're going to have over $200,000 in servers. Now that's before you go out and buy the racks and the cables and the cable ties and the little screws and the screwdriver because you never find the screwdriver to put things in the rack. And then you're going to need someone who actually will babysit this. And oh, by the way, the cleaning staff needs an extra body because you have this, this thing in there. So if you're doing an average rack of Hadoop clusters, it gets awfully expensive. Oh, and by the way, you probably will just get a discount from Dell or IBM or anyone else if you do buy 200 quantity of anything from them. So after you have your stuff, what are you supposed to do with it? And then I ran across this quote from the founder of Amazon. He never throws away anything. We have shows on A&E about people like that, but <laughs> if you're a multi-billionaire, uh, it's seen as brilliant. So I started talking to some of my colleagues who were doing big data projects, and I said, is this a valid assumption that you're never, ever, ever going to throw away everything? And they say, well, within reason. Uh, the recent IRS scandal, if you've been following that, um, evidently someone running Exchange Server never did backup and had only one set of tapes they recycled and they threw away disk drives. Um, I can see this. We never throw away anything being part of the government lore from now on. But the only trouble with that, well, before I go someplace else, um, this little quote, for some organizations facing hundreds of gigabytes of data for the first time may trigger a need to reconsider data management options. The options you want are for stock and disk drive companies. Uh, if you have tens of hundreds of terabytes before data size becomes a significant consideration, that's kind of like a Viagra commercial where they warn you about the four hour time period. Um, that is a lot of disk drives. If you've never managed a disk drive farm, uh, they'll tell you the mean time between failure will be several hundred thousand hours. Well, those are the average drives and the one they shipped you are the below average drives. And you'll start having them pop out at 100 hours, 1,000 hours, 500 hours. It gets really messy to have a, several terabytes of data. So you're saving everything and you end up with a digital landfill. Now, in some companies, you're small enough where you're able to keep every email. So you have the stuff from the softball league from 10 years ago. Uh, you have the things about who stole my lunch out of, the, out of the cafeteria. But in a lot of the world, you can't keep all the data. If you're doing credit card compliance, PCI rules say you can't keep all the information out there. Uh, if you're running HIPAA, if you're doing anything in the medical world, there are some records you have to retain and others you can't. Uh, Sarbanes-Oxley, you're supposed to keep some records for at least 10 years and possibly as many as 50. So those are the stuff you gotta keep. But what about the other stuff out there? Do you really wanna keep everything? And the big trouble is, if you're gonna manage this for the rest of your life, how are you gonna do it? Uh, you're gonna have to have disk drives spinning all the time because you write out the CD-ROM, you're guaranteed one year of life on average. If you print it out, you're going to have a vault full of documentation. Uh, if you write it out to a tape, you'll be lucky if you can reread it in three years. So suddenly we're not throwing everything away. We're being told to keep it, and then the laws are telling us different. Uh, for those of you under 40, you've probably ne never seen these ads. Uh, 10 megabit hard drives used to be a bargain at $3,500. And the ad on the left was one of the first IBM computers you could actually get into an office. Before that, they were kind of the size of a motorhome. So what are the vendors telling us about big data? Well, the first message, uh, including my company, is buy. You need to buy because you need big data. Big data is going to solve all your problems. Well, at Hadoop World last year, IBM had a big presentation. They had their VP of big data. And he said, I'm glad you're all here. I hope you've gone through the expo hall. There's 200 vendors there. And this time, several months from now, half of those companies will be out of business. Which sounds right, because startup businesses tend to fail rather quickly. And he said, another year from now, half of the half that's left are going to be out of business. Sounds right. Um, that's the way things tend to shake out. And then his next argument floored me. So therefore, you should all buy IBM because we've been around forever. <laughs> uh, 
Uh, if you can't see the, the caption in the back, it's a scientist with a rat before a maze. And it says, are you sure you're just not teaching to the test? So the more I dug into big data, the more I found out it was the emperor's new wardrobe. There was a lot of stuff that people were claiming to be there that I really didn't see. And the more I asked, the more I realized other people weren't seeing it. And it's what I call a science fair project. Uh, people were told they needed to have big data, so therefore, damn it, we went out and had a, a science fair project and we did something with big data. The uh, first one that hit me was that Avis spent billions of dollars to figure out what customers really needed during an economic downturn. And if you read between the lines, basically they were paying more attention to getting their customers to come back and repeat rent from them. I don't see why they needed big data for that. Um, people have been doing that for thousands of years when ec economics go, back, go bad. Uh, then the big flashy one, Lady Gaga decided that she wanted to have her own mailing list. So she went out and had her people use big data to contact everyone that had her Twitter feed and was her friend on Facebook to sign up for her mailing list. I'm so glad they used Hadoop clusters to do that. Uh, next, 1-800-Flowers, data mined, and used Hadoop. And they studied all the records, and they realized that people tend to buy flowers on reappear reappearing repeating time periods called years for things like birthdays and anniversaries and holidays. So by data mining, they're able to figure out that if your birthday is on the same date every year, maybe they, you want to get a flowers that year. Uh, the one that uh, on the bottom there, US cycling team, uh, if there's any cycle racing fans in there, um, you have my misery, uh, my commemoration. I used to race bicycles half a lifetime and 100 pounds ago. Uh, before the last Olympics, the team was worried because they were five seconds slower than everybody else. So they spent millions of dollars looking at everyone's biometric information, having doctors looking at it, processing and everything, and damn it, they went to the, to the Olympics and they were four seconds faster. Unfortunately, that got them a silver medal instead of a gold. Now, the trick with that is, could those athletes, rather than being having all the probes stuck in their various orifices and being watched by doctors, if they trained harder, could they picked up that other second? Uh, anyone know what this is a picture of? Uh, There's a gentleman named George Westinghouse who was studying the problems of railroads. One of the big problems used to be that if you had a train coming into a town, you had to slow down. Well, how did you do that? Well, you put people called brakemen on top of boxcars, and they walked up to big metal wheels and slowly started cranking the brakes on. But you could only do it so much per car before you had to go to the next car. And you had, if you had 100 cars, you had 100 brakes that had to be adjusted and reset. And as you slowed down further, you had to tighten down on the brakes. Meanwhile, the engine's slowing down. Big involved process, lots of labor, very dangerous, very costly. Uh, the train had to start slowing down miles before the town even appeared in the distance just to make sure you didn't overshoot where you wanted to go. So Westinghouse used something called compressed air to apply brakes. Uh, Westinghouse is also the guy who backed Nikolai Tesla for his uh, electronic experiments many years later. Uh, he became a very rich man and he started investing money in studying how people did things. And um, it's called the Hawthorne effect or the Westinghouse effect. Uh, what happened is he was trying to make everything better for his workers. So he figured, well, maybe if I give them brighter surroundings in the workshop, they'll be more productive. So they increased the lighting in the workshop and productivity went through the roof. Hey, that's great. Well, could we do something else to fiddle with their environment to make everything better? So they made more adjustments, productivity went through the roof. And eventually they get to the point where they realize, gee, we do anything, and they're so paranoid about what we're doing, they start working harder because they know we're up to something. So they switched everything back to the original configuration, you know, bad lighting, uh, no air and all that. And guess what? Productivity shot through the roof. Uh, shows that the paranoia of a worker is more powerful than just about anything else in American business. Uh, therefore, I think we should have this posted on the outside of every business in the country. 
So back to big data. Do we really need big data? Is there something new out there that needs us to quantify big data? Is there something so astounding and fresh and new that we really have to track it with all these extraordinary methods? Well, yes and no. Uh, if you're a DBA, until fairly recently, if you were doing a record that contained genders of a subject, you would probably do the binary option, male or female. I have two DBAs up here, and they're kind of <laughs> yelling at me. Well, if you had a really advanced DBA, they'd give you a third option. They'd put it on null. Uh, in the database world, null means you don't have any data. You don't have anything recorded for that. And it's a separate status, and it's a pain in the ass for processing data. But it does represent what it's supposed to do. Well, how many for your businesses this is good enough? Can I see a raise of hand? How many for your businesses can get by with male, male female, and unknown? <laughs> well, guess what? State of California has 17 official gender statuses. Facebook has 58 and growing. Uh, the funny thing about the one is in California, uh, someone I know who works for a municipality out there had to change all his data from the binary male, female to the 17, and then he had to report how that broke down by male, female to the state of California. Um, so, so if you see DBAs having problems and looking like this, it, it's not always the database. It's sometimes the, the needs being enforced on them. Now this is a picture of what a Frenchman in 1900 thought life in Paris would look like in the year 2000. And as you can see, he got it exactly right. Um, the uh, woman with headscarves and buffles, uh, bustles and the men in, in leather caps is uh, extraordinarily realistic. So, in the past, what did they think about big data? Well, there's a gentleman who decided that, given the way things were growing, that the Yale Library alone would need 200 million volumes of just to hold all the data in the world. Well, I checked. Uh, they're only 185 million short right now. So, is big data newish? Well, in 61, a gentleman predicted that as our population continues to grow, we'll have more and more scientific advances, and with that scientific advancement, we'll have more and more data. Well, the birth rate has declined, but we're still gathering more and more data despite the birth rate sinking. So it's not tied to birth rate. Uh, Arthur Miller uh, wrote this nice little quote. Too many information handlers seem to measure a man by the number of bits of storage this dossier will occupy. Uh, for those of you who don't know Arthur Miller, he was the prototypical alpha geek of his time period. And he was also married to Marilyn Monroe. So he's an expert on at least one thing. So we realized that big data isn't all that new. Someone not that far ago uh, in my lifetime said there may be a few thousand petabytes of data all told. A few thousand. Well, Facebook has close to a few thousand petabytes. So the scaling is, is kind of off. And then about two, three years ago, we started seeing people coming up and saying, gee, we're getting all this stuff, but does it really do us any good? You know, what happens to the data out there on you is bad. Could explain why I'm getting so many emails in my inbox for breast reduction surgery. And, um, my, my wife does not appreciate the, the things on prostate reduction medications. And, uh, it's kind of nasty. So maybe we're not really looking at a big data problem. Maybe our problem is we're too hyperactive. Maybe we're not looking at what we really want to study. What do we really want to do? What do we really want to know? And as I go around the world and I talk to big business leaders and folks doing big data projects, and I ask them the questions, what do you really want to know? When do you really want to know it? How do you quantify what you 
what you want. Often they say, well, we don't know what we don't know. And we're trying to trip over it and find it out. And others are saying, well, we're doing big data because all the ads say we should be doing big data. So you gather all that data and you hand it off to someone like this, who thinks four out of 10 is a majority. Uh, I bet you half the people in Congress couldn't pass that and, and tell you what's going on wrong there. Um, one of my favorite correlations is people who like single-sex public schools are more likely to do so if they enjoy Hot Pockets. No, correlation and causality are, are not always directly linked, but there's something in Hot Pockets that make people want to not be around members of the other sex. Um, this is a correlation between fresh lemons imported to the U.S. from Mexico and the death rate. Yeah. Um, I mean, it, it's, it's staggering how well that we're doing now that we don't, I guess it must be a scurvy problem that we're having trouble. <laughs> Unfortunately, people are looking at information like this and making decisions. Um, there's one that I, I can't mention that they decided they did some data mining and decided they were going to do a big investment in painting some of their cars blue because they found out that their cars that were blue colored only sold on Tuesday and therefore they're going to ramp up and make special deals on their imported cars that are going to be painted blue. Well, they finally did a second study and realized that the only reason the blue cars were selling more on Tuesday is that all the other colors were selling out on Monday. Uh, here's another one. Um, rate of ice cream sold versus the rate of murders. So I guess if we somehow got that in there with the limes, we were in trouble. Uh, best one yet. The suckiness of M. Night Shyamalan movies to the decline in newspaper readership. So his movies would be much better if we all had a subscription to a newspaper. Uh, this is better. Um, the murders in the US versus Internet Explorer releases. Or tech support. Yeah. So. How many of you are actually thinking of having a big data project at work because your boss wants you to have one, or you think that you need to get into it, or it's something that looks interesting to you? Any? OK. Uh, how many of you have gone into the big da data business, played around with it, and found absolutely nothing useful for your business, or something only kind of temporary? And how many of you are just saying, gee, they keep talking about big data. Maybe I should learn something about it. Maybe I should run Hadoop. And yeah. So if you really want to do a big data project, and you're working in a Fortune 400 company, um, God bless you, you get to go out and buy 100,000 boxes. Um, hopefully you'll be retirement age by the time things really come up for review. And by the way, getting 100,000 boxes running in any architecture and getting them stable before you start implementing takes a lot of effort and a lot of crew. Uh, third recommendation, stock and disk drive companies. Uh, the other reason if you're going to do big data. Um, sometimes you just need it to have that check mark for your boss on his yearly review. Oh, yeah, we implemented big data. Uh, if you do that, that's good. Now, for a very small number of us, um, you have the money, you have the budget, and you have the staff. Where the return on investment, we're going through this huge investment and minutely looking at your data is going to pay off. In the engineering fields, they've been using finite element analysis for decades to refine the quality of parts. That's why a Chevy uh, sedan now weighs about 1,200 pounds lighter than it used to. Uh, there are, are big bain, bains, gains to me being there, but they're not easy, they're expensive, and they take a lot of work. So um, I feel like I'm throwing up this this uh, signpost in front of you. But I, I just wanted to have a quick talk on big data and some of the trends and some of the things I'm seeing. And I also want to use this to gather information from you all. What are you guys hearing on big data? What are you guys realistically thinking about? Uh, is anyone else like me saying the emperor has no clothes? So. But I'm OK with it at the same time, because you're kind of my customer. Okay. So, 
Hey, I'm Nick. I'm a PhD student at Clemson, and so my research involves uh, moving large quantities of data. So I like people that have a lot of big data because they're my customers. I don't necessarily care what they do with it, but I will move it from A to B. Okay. And the funny thing is he will be collecting resumes from the rest of us at the end of the talk. What about in scientific research? I mean, isn't that kind of where Hadoop started from? And in things like, you know, search for planets and other solar systems? Um, and scientific research in some aspects, uh, especially in the medical field, where they do genetic sequencing, stuff like that. Not so much that, it's just that they have a process that they've had for a couple hundred years where you make a study, you publish your results, someone else looks at it, comes back and repeats them, or doesn't repeat them, and they publish their results. So over a period of time, you get a body of science that comes out and says, yeah, if, if, you, if you poke an infant with a sharp object in the right buttock, they will cry. Stimulus response, great, move on. Maybe we, next time we'll jab them with something not as sharp or something colder. They, they have a methodology. Um, a lot of the trouble with the global warming uh, methodology you see is someone rolling a data model and they won't give out the model, they won't give out their data. Is it right or it's wrong? Well, there's no way to test it. Uh, a lot of the social engineering data that you see um, is just pure garbage when you analyze it. Um, it's kind of like saying, well, tall people tend to play basketball, short people tend to ride horses, so therefore a tall person can't ride a horse. That's a lot of the, the problems I see there. Um, I would say one of the observations I'd make about your point is, um, and things I've seen with the work I've done and watched other people do, is I guess the, the concept of big data, say maybe 10, 15, 20 years ago, maybe we didn't use those words, but what you were trying to do with just data analytics in general, collected thing, there have been some really significant accomplishments, but I think we're kind of that next generation where, you know, with the new version of big data, yeah, I mean, and I think you've correctly pointed out that you, there is like a threshold of absurdity where you've, you, you've gained all the, the low-hanging fruit or, 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 or meaningful information that you can get, and then now you're just just simply by storing orders of magnitude more data of the same things, you don't necessarily gain any new analytical insight just automatically. The, so that's my observation. I uh, worked for a Columnar database company for a while, and the sweet spot on the data there was 26 billion rows. Uh, very few of us work for companies where they have records of 26 billion anything. But in one case, we had an airline that was looking through their records, trying to figure out baggage loss issues. Uh, when were they more likely to happen? What airports, what employees? And they were able to find out by time periods and correlation over years, it, you know, Ralph at DFW Airport was the guy who was stealing the camera bags off the belt. Um, could they have solved that faster and easier by having a camera or a supervisor watching Ralph? Yeah. Um, the, the big trouble is, this company spent lots of money with the business I was employed by, which I appreciated. Um, but I think the return on investment wasn't worth it. Ralph wasn't here today, is he? <laughs> uh, any other questions or comments or? Um, so, to be honest, uh, I mean, on my side, uh, on the vendor side, uh, I mean, I'm, I'm appreciating the interest in big data because it's part of what drives our business. Uh, that said, you had a use case when you talked about gender, and you, your use case talks about DBAs. One of the arguments against keeping everything in a relational database is because you need that overhead. With a standard unstructured database like, you know, Cassandra or Hadoop or something like that, your scenario doesn't require DBA. The developer just adds the additional elements to the gender list, and that's it. So there's a lot less overhead involved, and that's what seems to be attractive to a lot of, at least from an enterprise perspective, of this is why this database is better. Now, they ignore a lot of other things, but that's one of the areas that I'm hearing is that self-managed. Meaning, I don't need to hire this very expensive DBA to manage it. Yeah, I don't need a very expensive DBA, but I have to hire two PhDs in statistical research, which are a lot more of a pain in the butt. Yeah. 
Well, originally when COBOL came around, all the programmers were going to go away because it was a common object or common business oriented language. So therefore, any businessman could write down and type in select from this data, go to this data, giving that. Um, I think you might see the DVA title change slightly. To, instead of just being relational data, it's going to be all data. I also think you're going to see a whole bunch of branches of data scientists, um, maybe epidemiologists leaping into there. So, gee, we're going to save money by not having the pain in the ass DVAs anymore, but suddenly you have a whole new crop of pains in the butt. Well, thank you all for coming out. Uh, if you have any questions, I'm over in the Oracle booth around the corner. And uh, thank you all for coming out. Customers rely on your website or application. If it's slow or non-responsive, it infuriates your users and costs you money. Keeping your business critical systems humming along requires insight into what they're doing. Your system metrics tell stories, stories that can reveal performance bottlenecks, resource limitations, and other problems. But how do you keep an eye on all of your system's performance metrics in real time and record this data for later analysis? Enter Longview, the new way to see what's really going on under the hood. The Longview dashboard lets you visualize the status of all your systems, providing you with a bird's eye view of your entire fleet. You can sort by CPU, memory, swap, processes load, and network usage. Click a specific system to access its individual dashboard, then click and drag to zoom in on choke points and get more detail. Comprehensive network data, including inbound and outbound traffic, is available on the Network tab, and Disk Writes and Free Space on the Disks tab, while the Process Explorer displays usage statistics for individual processes. The System Info tab shows listening services, active connections, and available updates. Adding Longview to a system is easy. Just click the button, copy the one-line installation command, then run the command on your Linux system to complete the process. The agent will begin collecting data and sending it to Longview. Then the graphs start rolling. Use Longview to gain visibility into your servers, so when your website or app heats up, it stays up.